Hey guys, Ragnar here, and welcome back to part 2 of our little guide on how to pull off a playtesting session for a game you're working on. Last time we talked about different types of playtests, such as alpha and beta tests, bug tests, and the traditional playtesting with one player or at max a small group of people at the same time. And we looked into all the things you have to keep in mind and all the steps you have to take in order to prepare for it. Today we'll finally start with a long-awaited session itself, with tips and instructions on how to approach it, what to absolutely avoid and what to do once the test is over. I'll try and give you a few tips on what to do if you want to become a playtester. In the background of this video I'm going to show you, among others, footage of games that some of my viewers are currently working on. In the bottom I'll add some brief information about it and you can find links to their channels or greenlight pages in the description of this video, so please give these guys some well-deserved love for their hard work. So without further ado, I'm Ragnar and this is Game Design Focus. Alright, let's assume your tester is sitting in front of your game. As mentioned in part 1, you are holding your notes right in your hand and you have briefed the person about everything you believe is necessary for a player to know to get started. You have also started the recording software that will enable you to watch the entire playthrough later on. The first thing you want to make sure now is that you keep track of the amount of time played. So bring a stopwatch or if that's enough for you, just look at your watch or mobile phone and keep track of when the testing starts. Take notes of how long it takes the player to reach critical points in your game. For example, how long they need to finish the tutorial, when they start and finish each level, how long they need for puzzles, whatever you feel counts as important progress and write all of that stuff down. If they take a break for more than, say, 10 or 20 seconds, stop the timer, make a note about that little break and continue when they get back to actually playing. As we've said, you want to keep track of the actual playtime. Furthermore, you should also take notes when people are trying out new things, exploring things, especially when it's something you didn't foresee they do. And trust me, this will happen. They go off in directions you didn't expect, or they try to have fun with your mechanics in a way you didn't anticipate, Write it down. That stops valuable information. Now, one of the most important things to keep in mind all the time is that you want to reduce communication with your tester as much as possible. You'll most likely feel the urge, because your game is in an unfinished state, to make excuses or explain yourself when something isn't working as it's intended for the final release. When there's bugs, glitches, missing assets, placeholders, you'll be tempted to say things like oh, that isn't supposed to happen or okay, we're definitely gonna fix that. But don't. Resist that temptation. It's really, really hard, but most players won't even notice these things as they experience your game from a completely different perspective than you. Also, avoid being a guide for them. Never tell your player what he's supposed to do. Never give them hints when they get stuck unless it's absolutely vital and the current state of your game is missing the exposition for these hints. Because once the game is released, you won't be able to travel to each player individually and give them hints, right? So just let them play. If a player gets stuck, let them beat their heads around it for at least 30 minutes. It's gonna be agonizing for them and it's gonna be even more cringeworthy to watch. For instance, when they are attempting to solve a puzzle and it looks like the solution is so close, but they just won't get it. Don't help them. There is good information in watching how they struggle and why. Now, it is okay to sometimes go ahead and ask questions like, what are you thinking right now? Or what is it you're trying to achieve, as long as you don't make it sound judgmental or pretentious. Also, if you realize that the player is obviously stuck and it feels like they're about to give in and quit playing, that might be the point where you can give them hints, but never give them direct instructions, but rather try making them ask the right questions themselves. Hint them to something that they might have overlooked, like, okay, what are you trying to do? What's your goal here? And what would you need to achieve that? If you have to give hints, then make it subtle. Something like, maybe there's another ability you'll learn but haven't used in a while that could be of help? Questions that lead the player to the correct pattern of thinking so they find the solution or they learn the ability they need on their own. Just like Morpheus says, But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. At some point, your tester might start asking questions like, Am I supposed to do this? Is this right? 
while being watched, and usually I recommend to respond with silence. In order to make this quiet demeanor of yours not feel totally awkward for them, you should warn them beforehand that you'll not be answering every question they ask, because it's about seeing a person play on their own and not give them a walkthrough. If it feels too cumbersome for you to say nothing, you could just answer something like, I won't answer that, just play as if I weren't here, or something along these lines. And to go full circle with everything, make notes of all of this. Even if you refrain from answering a question, it's helpful to remember in which situations a player might feel unsure and starts asking questions. Because mostly that doesn't happen when everything's going straight forward, but when the game throws more information at the player than they can process at once. So write it all down with time codes. If you have more than one tester, it might be helpful to walk that extra mile and build some metric recording routines in your program, meaning that your game automatically locks times and certain events triggered in a playthrough into a text file or a database. Heck, this is even super helpful if it's only one person. The rule of thumb is, the more data you can gather, the better. Alright, at some point your test run will be over. For how long you want people to play is totally up to you and depends on what kind of data you want. If you just want to find out how new players approach your game, the session doesn't have to be that long, usually. On the other hand, if you want to find out how long a player usually spends with your game until they naturally feel like taking a break or quitting the game for good, that might take a little longer. Or maybe not so long in case what you created is far from being engaging. But when the test is over, first of all, remember that you're not doing this as a validation that you've done a good job. That's not what this is about. This kind of approval comes later, after the release or when you go gold. You might very likely receive negative feedback and or find that people didn't enjoy the game or at least certain aspects of it. And that is good. I can't stress that enough. It's great that you have actual feedback and know in which parts your work still lacks polish and refinement, or is even in need of a complete overhaul. Players not liking the game is what you want now and not later, because now you can still fix it. Once you've released it, that train has sailed. Therefore, there's a certain risk in playtesting with friends and family, because people that are close to you might be careful not to hurt your feelings and avoid giving you negative feedback. Let them know, directly and beforehand, that it's totally okay to be harsh and critical and that this is actually what you're looking for. Or if you want to be a bit more manipulative, you could tell that they will, in fact, help you less by saying good things. So it might require you to somewhat draw the negative criticism out of people, because in person most people are really reluctant to offer negative feedback over positive. So try not to look super happy when they encourage you what you've done right, because that will also make them feel happy and it encourages them to only say nice things and avoid the bad. Be a robot, hide your emotions. Also, don't put answers in their mouth, like asking, did you enjoy the third stage? But instead, go for a more diplomatic approach, like, what do you think about the third stage? Technically, it's just semantics, but this kind of post-playtest interrogation really requires a certain amount of diplomatic eloquence. But interrogate you must, so have another questionnaire prepared. And this one specifically with questions that will probe deeper into the player's experience during the playthrough. I can't give you an example questionnaire in this case, because it's completely dependent on your game and on what you want to know from the player. But do it instantly, as soon as possible, after the playthrough. And I'd even recommend you do it by asking them verbally and recording the answers with a microphone instead of letting them write it down. A, because people are possibly tired or exhausted after playing for a long time and therefore might rush the answers and leave some things out and B, in an audio recording, or maybe even in a video recording, you'll get a plethora of additional information between the lines, because, you know, everybody lies. So when you take facial expressions, intonation, gestures, meaningful pauses, etc. into consideration, you'll find that even more elliptical persons might provide you with a lot more intel than it seems at first glance. So ask them if they understood the mechanics and if they're able to explain them. 
ask them specific questions about their understanding of your game, ask them to retell the story in their words, ask them if something confused them, ask them if something frustrated them, ask them if there was something that they thoroughly enjoyed, ask them if they have any feedback and suggested improvements for you, and so on and so forth. Now, when you're through with this, how do you interpret these results? How do you draw conclusions? How do you read all the data that Playtest provided you? Just like with the questions before, I can't give you a clear and direct answer to that, because likewise, this depends on your game and on what you're looking for. But what I can do is give you a sort of prime directive, and that is be self-critical. Don't be disappointed, don't be offended, and never lie to yourself. If the results show that 3 out of 10 people didn't understand stage 4, then don't try to talk it down or find excuses. Be straight to yourself and admit that stage 4 is in dire need for refinement. If you find that the person needed way longer than you anticipated for a certain part of your game, if someone didn't understand mechanics, don't blame the tester, but know that you just found something that has to be improved. I've come across people who would go on angry rants on social media after they were disappointed by the results of a playtest, after they realized that their super simple prototype they spent weeks on didn't captivate the players in the way they hoped for, and blame the tendency of modern AAA developers to turn people into stupid zombies for the bad feedback they got from their playtest. Well, this doesn't help them at all. Blaming others for something you didn't get right is a Dunning-Kruger effect. So, I'm repeating myself, but become a masochist. Enjoy everything negative you find about your game, because that's what this entire session is about. And that's how you should read and interpret your results, as a foundation for optimization and iteration. Asian, Asian, Asian. Alright, that's all I have on how to perform a playtest for now. If you should have questions, please feel free to ask them, and if you have something to add, you're just as welcome to do so. Before we wrap this up, there's still the matter of what to do if you want to become a playtester for someone else. So the first question you should ask yourself is what kind of game you want to be testing. If you want to take a look into a big budget AAA title that's in development, and yes, that's absolutely possible, those guys are constantly on the lookout for new testers, then be aware that proximity is your friend, meaning the closer you are to their developer studios, or for that matter to the places where they hold the playtests, the more likely you're gonna get invited. In the case of Valve, for example, it helps to live in the Seattle Bellevue area and they completely limit the application for playtesters to the US only. And yes, they mostly do those tests in-house because they simply can't afford leaking early builds of their games to the public. So you're gonna have to apply. All of those companies have application forms or special email addresses hidden somewhere on their websites. That's what you have to dig for. But because Ragnar is your friend, I've added the links to a handful of companies like Valve, Microsoft, Ubisoft, Activision, Eidos Montreal, Bethesda, Gearbox, Paradox, Electronic Arts and Nintendo in the description of this video. So go ahead and send an application as a tester, and make sure you thoroughly check for proper spelling and grammar. I mean, if you ask me, you should always do that, no matter in which context, but this one is an application, so make sure you make it concise, short and to the point. And the same goes for indies, small team projects or even hobby games, because those guys are equally in constant need for testers. In this case, it's probably even a bit easier to get in contact with them. Because, well, the internet is your friend, but you'll have to become proactive and scout for them. Look for small teams scouting for testers, for instance, on Reddit. You'll find people on the subreddits rplaytesters, rgamedev, or rgamedesign from time to time. And there are probably more subreddits focused on making games where people might be asking for testers to come forward. Look in communities like Desura, Gamasutra, Gamedev.net or Stack Exchange. And one thing that I'd really recommend is directly contacting developers on Greenlight through Steam with your Steam account. If you find a project that's on Greenlight, doesn't matter if it already has been greenlit or not, when it's still in development, chances are that those guys are in need for testers. 
and no matter which route you take, approach them with a friendly message. As always, try to keep it brief and direct. Don't waste these guys' time with a 20 paragraph long essay on how much you love video games since you were a child like I do on my channel. Just tell them a little bit about yourself, that you're interested in being a playtester, that you're aware that it's actual work and not just amusement, tell them that you're ready and willing to accept, sign and honor an NDA, and that should be it. And once again, check your message or application for spelling and grammar. It's more important for a first impression than you might think. Alright guys, that's all I got for you today. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something useful. If yes, then please give this video a like, subscribe to my channel for more videos in the future, follow me on Facebook for news and updates, and if you want to support me with this show, then I'd be delighted if you consider joining my Patreon. My name is Ragnar, and I'll see you guys next time on Ragnaroks. Ragnarok.